A very good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm excited to welcome to the 146th webinar of the webinar series conducted by the BSL, the first webinar series which is conducted in English. The webinars are conducted on the Zoom platform, and for those who have been unable to register on Zoom, could also join by watching the live stream on the BASL YouTube channel. These webinar series are organized by the seminars committee of the BASL, chairman of the seminars committee, Mr. Rajiv Amarasuriya, convener of the seminars committee, assistant secretary, BASL, Mr. Pasindu Silva, and the co-conveners, Mr. Pandulavan Niarachi, Mr. Oshanu Beratna, Ms. Ann Devananda, and Ms. Nikini Maptigama. I further take this opportunity to thank the president of the BASL, Mr. Salia Pires, President's Council and other members of the Management Committee of the BASL for all support and guidance. Today's topic is Law of Negligence, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce this team panel and moderator for this evening. Mr. Nihal Fernando, President's Council, was called to the bar in the year 1982, and Mr. Fernando was conferred silk as a President's Council in 2004. With over 30 years of experience as a litigation counsel practicing predominantly in civil and commercial law. Mr. Fernando has been recognized by Legal 500 as a lead counsel in the Asia Pacific region, who is a prominent figure in the finance and corporate sphere. Also, Mr. Fernando has also been recognized as one of the top eight leading practitioners in Sri Lanka by publications such as Chambers and Partners. And also we have with us Mr. Riyad Amin, attorney at law, he has obtained his LLB from University of London, an LLM from University of Colombo, and another LLM from King's College, London. He is a barrister of Lincoln's Inn, and he has been in practice in the bar for 23 years. Next, we have with us Dr. Avanti Pereira. She's a senior state counsel at the Attorney General's Department. She holds a master's degree in international law from the University of Cambridge, a doctor, doctorate in law from the University of Oxford, and also a BA special first class degree in English from the University of Colombo. Dr. Pereira is in the Supreme Court unit of the Aegis Department and has wide experience in the fields of fundamental rights and constitutional law. As a supervising officer, medical negligence has been an area assigned to her. She has represented the government of Sri Lanka in negotiations of bilateral agreements and also been invited by the World Health Organization and the World Intellectual Property Organization as an expert and a resource person at International Fora. Dr. Pereira is the author of the book, Medical Negligent Claims in Sri Lanka, and she regularly makes scholarly contrib contributions on this subject, on the invitation of medical legal fraternities. Dr. Pereira has previously served as a visiting lecturer at the Department of English University of Colombo and a graduate teacher at the faculty of Oxford University. Further, she is a fellow of Cambridge Commonwealth Society. And the moderator of the session this evening is Mr. Amit Silva, attorney at law. He has obtained a first class honors at Sri Lanka Law College with LLB from Open University of Sri Lanka and LLM from the University of Colombo. Also, he has admitted as an associate member of SIMA UK in 2008. He has been in practice in the bar for 18 years, both in original and appellate courts in commercial litigation covering the areas of insurance law and damages claiming, including claims on medical negligence, the topic for today. Members joining the session by Zoom may send in their questions through the Q&A chat box to reach the moderator. I will now hand over the proceedings to the moderator. Over to Mr. Silva. Thank you, Shamika. Welcome. When one lives in a society, he has to be mindful to live in a way that his actions do not affect others. This is the duty he owes to the society. Naturally, when there is a breach of this duty by a wrongful act or omission, the law intervenes to make things right. In a very simple form, this is our topic for today. It is interesting to see that this simple principle has many applications to different situations we face in our lives. Mr. Nihal Fernando, President's Counsel, is one of the senior most civil practitioners we have at the bar. 
Sir, will you be able to enlighten us on this very vast topic in a summary form for the use of the practitioners? Over to you, sir. Thank you, Amit. Thank you, Amit. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And good evening to panelists. Uh, the topic today given to us is very a very wide subject. It is the law of negligence in Sri Lanka. Now, as you know, when you say law of negligence in Sri Lanka, it is not limited to negligence in delict. So firstly, what I intend doing is to give you the basis and the boundaries of this subject and then go into, in summary manner, the areas that should be covered, explaining in a, in a, in a summary, because it's difficult to go through the whole thing uh, within the short period of time. Now, when you say negligence in Sri Lanka, firstly, you got to see what is the source of law that is applicable, the types of negligence, and how it works. Now, when, you say, when I say source of law, negligence is referred to in common law. Negligence in Delhi, common law in Sri Lanka is the Roman Dutch law. And as such, the applicable law is the Roman Dutch law, subject to the statutory invasion and uh, encroachment into the common law, which will be dealt in detail by the other speakers. Uh, the main law is the Roman Dutch law. In addition to the common law aspect of negligence, which is common law in, uh, negligence in daily, there is a statutory negligence aspect of it. Now, statutory negligence, statutory negligence, when you say statutory negligence, there is the strict liability negligence referred to in various statutes. Which I, we don't intend, which I don't intend dealing in detail in this webinar because we are giving 90% of the time to deal with negligence in delict. Right? So, Amit, I think we have to change the screen, Amit. The screen is, uh, I don't know whether it's past the Can't hear you, you're, you're muted. No, we can see you, sir. We can see you, no? Right, okay, fine. Yes, okay. yes. I, yes. Yeah, sure. No, I can see you only in a large screen. <laughs> I think it's okay, fine. If you don't, you just, just cut off your video and then on it again. Okay, okay, got it. Right. So to stick again to go through the statutory negligence part of it, the negligence referred to in the statute books, there can be strict liability, and there it, it affects the burden of proof. There are, there are certain conditions that are laid down in proving. For example, before I get to that uh, negligence in delict, uh, the Companies Act, the new Companies Act says that if the directors are negligent in dealing with uh, the affairs of a company in the process of winding up if it is found that they have been negligent they'll be liable to return the monies so the concept of negligence comes in by statute there then rash and negligent driving under the penal code death cause uh, causing death by rash and negligence it is not murder it is a uh, culpable homicide not amounting to murder so those are areas the criminal areas of negligence Similarly, the case law sometimes uh, encroaches into and then defines what negligence is. In shipping law, if uh, there's a case, Kalani case, which says that if a ship is arrested in a manner gross negligently, we is called gross negligence and malafides, then the ship owner can claim damages by way of a counterclaim. 
So all these areas, those are the areas that are covered when you say negligence in Sri Lanka. Now, leaving that aside, we will go now to negligence in delict. As I mentioned, that is the main subject that we are going to deal with, although the boundaries of this topic is fairly large, I mean extent, extensive. Negligence in delict <coughs> is delictual liability. Now, delictual liability, when you say delictual liability, how does it work? Declare a person negligent or to recover them in order to recover damages, it is moreover, moreover necessary to prove that the damage was due to a deliberate act of the defendant, it's called dolus in Roman law, or negligence, culpa. Negligence may be defined as doing of, a, doing of something which in the circumstances a reasonable man would not have done, or the failure to do something which in the circumstances a reasonable man would have done. Now there, in technical terms, you call it a commission or a omission of an act which causes damage to somebody. It's called negligence. How do you assess negligence? How do you define neg How do you find that you're negligent? The standard applied is that the reasonable man in Roman law, Roman law, the case required is not the highest possible care, but the degree of care which might be expected of a reasonable man in the position of the defendant. The Roman lawyers at that time recognized three degrees of culpa. But the only two degrees of culpa which are of any importance is the culpa lata, that is the gross negligence, which is of so serious and reckless in character as to amount to almost to a deliberate act and culpa levis, the ordinary negligence, which will entitle an injured person to damages provided. It is not so slight as to the shade off into a mere accident. There is moreover no such thing as negligence in the abstract. The question of negligence is a question of fact that has to be understood very clearly, ladies and gentlemen. The question of negligence is a question of fact, depending on the circumstances of each case. The duty of care arises whenever a reasonable man in the position of the defendant ought to know that a failure on his part to exercise care might result in damages to another person and need not therefore take the precautions against the mere possibility of harm not amounting to such a likelihood as would real, be realized by a reasonable and a prudent man. Now, this is definition of negligence. It should dismantle it. To be negligent, there has to be a commission or an omission which affects a third party and causes damages. Now, how do you decide whether to do this act or whether to do the whether the commission should be done or the omission or either how do you decide that whether there's a commission or an omission you reverse back to the principle of duty of care the principle of duty of care is a very interesting principle unless there's a duty of care there is no negligence on the part of the defendant. You see, in Roman Dutch law, a defendant cannot be made liable in damages in the absence of proof of negligence. Negligence is the breach of duty of duty to take reasonable care. And where negligence is alleged, the duty must be proved to have existed, to have existed. That is important. Culpa implies that there was a relationship between the parties and in the shape of a duty on the part of the defendant towards the plaintiff to exercise that degree of care which a diligent or careful man would have exercised under the circumstances. 
So, you see, this again now goes back, you reverse back again to another principle. I said it, it is a commission or omission which causes damage to a third party. And to decide that, you go back to a duty of care. If there must be a duty of care on the person, the defendant, to do something or not to do something, not to have done something. So in deciding that, what is the extent of it? That principle is called the foreseeability. Whether you should have done something or not done something, the person should have foreseen that. A reasonable man should have foreseen if he does something that will cause damage to that third party, the party who is injured. Or if he does not do something, it will cause damage to the party concerned. So you see how it go, works. You start with the foreseeability of your responsibility to society. You must be vigilant. I mean, a simple example is that if a lawyer doesn't doesn't study his study the law and is ignorant of the law and advises a client and does something, surely he he should know that if his his ignorance will cause damage, and he should foresee that is foreseeability. Or if a drunkard man gets into a vehicle, drunk, intoxicated, he should know he will not be in a sense, proper senses to drive the vehicle and he may cause damage. So that is foreseeability. He should have foreseen that. Or if at a crossing, somebody jump, go, uh, crossing, you're expected to slow down and see whether anybody is crossing the road. And if you don't do that, you foresee that the person will get injured. Or in medical negligence or whatever, Dr. Avanti will deal in, in direct, uh, dear, I mean, directly on that subject. If you have a dispensary or a surgery without proper equipment, you should know your possibility. You will foresee that if you do some operation without, or uh, what do you call it, disinfecting the equipment, the patient will get some infection. So that is possibility. Then, you fix the foreseeability, you, you a reasonable man. You don't, you're not expected to foresee things that you cannot put, you cannot envisage or you don't, I mean, you will never think of. There's a limit to that. So foreseeability, a reasonable man would see what will happen to the other party if you don't do something or not do something. And then the, there's a duty to do something or not to do something. So that is how this framework of negligence works. There's a duty of care to do something or not to do something. And you foresee that if you do that or not do that, there'll be damage to the party concerned. So that is the basic framework of law of negligence. To put it very in a technical way, duty arises in Roman Dutch law whenever the defendant whose act is com at complaint of should reasonably have foreseen the possibility of harm being caused by his act to another person, except perhaps in the cases in which the act complaint can be said to be justified or excused. You see, so <clears throat> there's slight difference between the English law and the Roman Dutch law which I believe Riyad Amin will go through that in detail. So that, having said that, what are the defenses that, or, or what are the, uh, the burden of proof and the defenses that a person has when you plead negligence? One of the main defenses, or before I get to that, before I get to the defenses, there, is, there are certain circumstances where there is strict liability, where there is resist per locator, the principle of resist per locator. This deals with under burden of proof. If a man drives a vehicle and goes into a bus stand and injures a person or kills a person who is peacefully sitting there waiting for a bus, the burden of proof changes. The facts speak for themselves. You don't need to prove that he's negligent how it happens and whether he was foreseen and all that. The burden of proof shifts when it comes to respect per locator. Then we'll deal with the deal, uh, the 
defenses that a defendant will have when you deal with this aspect of negligence relating to possibility duty of care the commission or omission of an act right one of the defenses main defenses that a person will have is voluntary non fit injury that is now to deal with voluntary non fit injury that to say the least is where actually this is uh, quite often relied upon by hospitals and doctors and professionals to say that the person concerned knew very well that plaintiff knew very well him or her interesting something to be done to the professional or the doctor will may cause damage and knowingly and willingly consents to the procedure being done there are certain operations where mainly cosmetic procedures where you in medical negligence cases you produce the consent form so that alone will not excuse the defendant the court will wait and see is that the reason or not that alone will not be it will only reduce or enhance the damages the level of damages that the person is claiming then the next one is contributory negligence now when it comes to contributory negligence the mere fact that you have pleaded guilty in the magistrate court or in the court of law doesn't mean that the defendant must pay the entire damage to the plaintiff if a person you know there are cases where in a hotel the interesting case where we settled it is all over in a luxury resort down south this person was going in a speed boat and there were instructions to wear the jacket life jacket and to be seated with your belt on this man stood up and was trying to hold his hands wide and what happened was another speed boat went and knocked his arm and his arm got dislocated totally so you see there it is true that the second speed boat was going at high speed and should have avoided this other boat but this man was expected to be seated with his belt on but when in fact he stood up and put his hands away he was basically asking somebody to there there's a degree of negligence on his part also so in those circumstances you plead in latin what you call it impari delicto potius conductio defendens if the plaintiff himself is negligent to a great extent right there are cases where i have done cases where uh, a tri show in a tri show a person fell off the tri show and injured i mean the the knee was injured badly damaged crushed but there was no damage whatsoever to the other vehicle the van or the bus that was that had knocked in so what happened is that this tri show driver has packed this tri show with far more than number of people that he could carry in this tri show and this man's leg and his head was outside the tri show right a bus overtaking or a van overtaking knocked his neck and he continued so when the police came they found that there was no damage to either vehicle it just that this man's leg has been injured knock so we found that he has been putting his leg out or head out and going which is not expected to do and that is contributory negligence and in those circumstances the court will weigh and see the degree of negligence on either party and assess the damages and apportion it so that's one of the defenses another defense is immunity for example you can sue judges the statute says the president is immune in the constitution so if somebody is just something negligent you are expected you can't sue them because they are immune judges can't be sued for wrong orders that are given or opinion that is done 
in the best interest by a lawyer it is it, it, your or appearing in court your immune what you say in court is your immune so immunity attaches in certain circumstances and that is one of the defenses that one can take another one is act of god the defendant can say look this is not my fault although i took all the precautions sorry this is what happened it, it, it is i couldn't have avoided it another defense <coughs> is cons- consent i dealt with the consent part of it i dealt with where you give a consent to do something voluntarily and then that is so those are some of the defenses that we have now <clears throat> to deal in detail with as a litigant's point of view of negligence we're not drafting papers or pleadings the law makes it obligatory on the part of the defendant plaintiff to plead details of negligence the court is not expected to go on a fishing expedition to see how the defendant was negligent the plaintiff should deal with that in detail and plead the person who is negligent and the manner in which that person is to be fixed for his breach of duty the omission or the commission and in what manner even in a simple accident case you have to say that the person was negligent in this manner and plead a b c d he was driving fast he was not didn't take any care of the other people on the road or he drove a vehicle without brakes he when he gets into the car and finds that his brakes are not working now he has a, he, that is foreseeability there is duty of care and he, he should have ensured that his brakes are on properly working before he started the vehicle so those are things that has to be pleaded in the plaint in detail you have to plead negligence in the plaint another aspect that i want to deal with is the pleadings is one thing what are the consequences of claiming damages in the you know in a pleading in a court of law now in a court of law there are two things that one has to prove very people a lot of people particularly outstation courts when we go we find that a lot of people they fix the negligence part of it the liability part of it but forgets to prove the damages now that is very basic there are two aspects to it first you got to prove your liability you fix the liability then you prove your damages damages depends on the circumstances of the case for example in the case of personal injury you get the special damages and the general damages special damages is the actual cost incurred or the expenses that you have incurred in getting yourself back to the same place position restoring back yourself in the same position and the general damages is the long term inconvenience or the damage that have been caused to you which is assessed reasonably by a judge considering the age of the plaintiff the measure he could do another job all those things will be considered then with regard to what kind of damages that you can claim is also to be considered there are encroachment of i mean the the common law principles in sri lanka it is pecuniary loss that is actual damage which can be assessed in money terms in simple language is the only damages that can be claimed pain of mind cannot be claimed in sri lanka except that recently there was a act enactment where they imposed brought in pain of mind where the death is of a particular category of person the father mother the relation and the circumstances in those circumstances you can claim pain of mind by a limited category which will be dealt in detail by the other speakers so those are the subjects that i intended doing in giving the basic structure culpa uh, was dealt with then positive act of omission and commission the neighbor prince now you know this subject goes in you know 
such a vast subject is difficult to deal with the whole thing. When you say duty of care, there's the Donald Stevenson principle, where the where the where the you don't have to have a relationship with a particular person to cause the damage. For example, industrial and manufacturing concerns, or you uh, they they manufacture something and put out to the public, or they put out something that is uh, a drug which doesn't work properly and has side effects, which is uh, which is not manufactured properly, subject to guidelines. You see, or certain, uh, now in this Donovan Stevens, it is the famous case where they, you don't have to identify the, the person who will be injured. It may be the public at large. So anybody who is affected can be, can sue the manufacturer, right? Then that that will be part of the, other one that I want to tell you, uh, inform, uh, deal with this. Rule in Rylance versus Fletcher. Now that is not part of the Sri Lankan law. That there, there are cases which says that in Samid versus Singapore. 25 NLR 481, the matter was put to rest with the court holding that the ruling Rylan of Fletcher had no application in Sri Lanka because the case was governed by Roman Dutch law. So there are the, those are the differences between the English law principles and the Sri Lankan law principles. Then comes the parties to the case. This will be the structure, the parties to the case. Who are the people who can be made liable in respect of the primary person who commits on does not commit, who commission or not commission an act. Who are the people that the plaintiff can be can may be uh, can be named? Plaintiff can name as defendants. There again, the principle of the important principle: vicarious liability. The employer is liable for the acts of the. Is employee provided that the employer employee has acted during the course of his employment and within the scope of his employment? If he does something outside of his hours, he is not liable. Or if he was driving his vehicle on his way to some his or a driver of a person, if my driver goes and knocks somebody, I am liable because he is driving me. He is driving under my authority. But that, that that's another all factual position to be proved. One has to prove that that even in all these cases they plead the defendant was acting at all times material to this action within the scope within during the scope of his employment and within the scope of his employment within the scope assigned to him. There are cases, interesting cases. I can't. I mean, I don't want to. Where people have acted in a very rash and negligent manner outside of his hours and damaged and cause serious injury to people. And they have been uh, sued, but the employers have got out of liability on the basis that that is totally outside the scope of that. Or if there's a brawl in a factory inside, or somebody assaults somebody or does something which causes injury, the employer has not employed that man to cause injury to the others. Employers employed him to do a specific job, which is subject to the job description in his employment and all that. Another diff another position is independent contractors. You're, you're muted. Yeah. Yes, it's a vast area. I can wind up in, uh, in another two or three minutes. Sir. We can move right. on. To the right. Sure, so sure. This is only there. the basics, the Separate. basic structure yeah. I'm giving. I do understand. Yeah. It's a vast area. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, will, I will deal with you now. Another area is the independent contractors. Now, when it comes to medical negligence, we have cases that have been held that contract of service and contract for service, both your vicarious reliable. Because we, there are cases where we have taken on the position in uh, doctors, consultants are independent contractors. They go around every hospital, different hospitals, and engage themselves in performing professional duties as operate surgical surgeries and uh, consultations. And if they are negligent, the hospital is also liable because the 
law of negligence and the vicarious liability attaches for in respect of a contract of service and a contract for service an independent contractor is you can't plead independent contractors defense by in those circumstances so that is basically the subject area if i miss something i don't know give me another one minute i'll just see the basic structure i believe i covered this will be dealt with in detail by riyadamin and uh, sri adamin and uh, dr avanti it will be more interesting uh, yeah that, that's basically that is the basic structure and the boundaries i'm sorry it is only a basic boundaries and the structure of it that i have given with the definitions to be dealt with in detail by the others thank you very much thank you thank you sir thank you sir uh, as uh, mr nihal fernando president's council explained our general law in this regard is roman dutch law however it's not the it's not in the same original form it was uh, 50 100 years back acts of legislature judicial decisions have shaped and molded the application to make our law in certain instances somewhat unique may i now call upon mr riyad amin to address the major areas of this application and the limitations or modifications of the general law of negligence over to you mr amin mm-hmm. good evening ladies and gentlemen um let me take it from where mr nihal fernando president's council left uh the general law of delict is roman dutch law as he explained but there are certain segments of the law of delict uh, that deviate from the roman dutch law as it originally existed so the two areas that i'll be dealing with are uh, contributory negligence and uh, the recent amendment to the recent act number 2 of 2019 that deals with uh, actions relating to deceased persons where they have died due to a wrongful act or negligence of another person um, so let me start with contributory negligence first um boom roman dutch law has its origins um, somewhere towards the end of the medieval period the 15th 16th or the 17th century um but roman law predates all of that roman law is uh, is around the 5th century it's uh, justinian's time emperor justinian's time uh, justinian's code was enacted in uh, around 540 538 around that time and insus of justinian also date back to that period so classical roman law was uh, was in that era and at that time uh, there was no known concept of contributory negligence uh, there was lex aquilia and if the requirements of lex aquilia were satisfied uh, the claimant was entitled to damages the defendant had to show that the those requirements had not been fulfilled and to that extent he could use the negligence of the claimant but contribute to negligence was not a known defense at that time um moving ahead about 1000 years to the medieval period about the 15th or 16th century um many people found that roman law to be unsatisfactory there were moves to change it um there were different there were different uh, attempts made towards changing it um the first to change it first to attempt to change it was the dutch uh, they didn't change it the entirety of the law of delict they they started with uh, the ship collisions and for ship collisions in the uh, 18th century uh, they started apportioning damages depending on the culpability of uh two ships that collide um, so as uh, that was only limited to that area i didn't extend beyond ship collisions and as far as the rest of the law of contributory negligence was concerned they applied what was known as the all or nothing rule that is if the defendant was able to show that the damage suffered by the plaintiff was due to the negligence of the plaintiff or the plaintiff was Uh, contributed the negligence the defend that was a complete defense the plaintiff was not entitled to any damages there was no question of 
apportionment of damages or reduction of damages like i said except for the the dutch deviation the roman dutch law deviation for for ship collisions except for that classical roman law was the all or nothing approach as is commonly called where if you prove if the defendant was able to prove contributory negligence on the part of the plaintiff that is that the damages were caused with the negligence of the plaintiff that was a complete defense the plaintiff was not entitled to any damages at all that around uh, a few hundred years later still before the 19th century uh, english law uh, developed uh, something slightly different called the last option rule and um, it was there uh, the, the the rule was that whoever had the last opportunity of avoiding the accident or the damage had, made, had to take the entire uh, liability so um, if if the plaintiff had the last opportunity of avoiding the damage the plaintiff was liable for the entirety of the damage if the defendant had the last opportunity of avoiding the damage so the defendant was liable for damage so that's how that's the principle that english law applies it's called the last opportunity um the reason i mention this is because you you if you go to the law reports in sri lanka uh from about 1 nlr all the way up to about 50 60 nlrs you see uh you see these principles being used um the, the last opportunity rule in under english law and also to some extent the roman dutch law principles of all or nothing that is if in other words to show uh there was contribution if the defendant is able to show contribution which is the part of the plaintiff the entire action was dismissed if the uh, there was no case of apportionment so this was found to be unsatisfactory uh, by most commentators and there was a uh, there was a push for law reform um in netherlands in the um, in in about 1918 or 1920 the supreme court delivered a judgment uh, the supreme court of netherlands delivered a judgment where they uh, recognized apportionment south africa which was still applying roman dutch law didn't have apportionment so there was a push for um, reform of the law in south africa uh, by introduction of a statute and they were looking towards english law uh, in england there was a push for reform the same they were also unhappy with the last of the rule and in so it all started with uh, the change that happened in uh, in england in england in in the uh, About the 1945, they passed the Law Reform Contributory Negligence Act, um, and uh, that act allowed apportionment of damages. So it, it was no longer a complete defence. If the defendant was able to prove that the plaintiff was responsible for the uh, the, uh, the the plaintiff was also negligent, the damages would be reduced. It, it was no longer a case where the plaintiff's action would be completely dismissed. Um, that reform that took place in England in 1945 uh, also happened in South Africa. I don't have the year, but at some point, and it also have it happened in Sri Lanka in 1967, 1968, Act Number 12 of 1968. So by Act Number 12 of 1968, uh, Section Three. effectively uh, changed the common law that existed so a lot of the judgments that you would find reported from 1 nlr all the way up to about the uh, 60 60s nlrs you would find has now been changed by section 3 of act number 12 of 1968 so in terms of act number 12 of 1968 the only consequence of contributory negligence by the defendant is that the quantum of damages would be reduced and the claim would not be defeated um the and if the court section 32 requires the court to reach a finding with regard to the total quantum of damages before it engages in the exercise of trying to apportion the damages for contributory negligence so the court can't simply say there's contributory negligence and try and uh, Uh, award a reduced sum to the plaintiff the court has to reach a finding with regard to the sum and then apportion it thereafter based on the relative contribution by the plaintiff to the defendant for those damages the act number 12 of 1968 apart from apart from changing the common law so it is something else 
they also uh, the active self is uh, it's, it's um, brings in both contribute negligence and wrongdoers so it had another section that brought in wrongdoers so a plaintiff the, so the while the plaintiff will name all the defendants that it wants for the action uh, for the purpose of plaintiff's claim the defendant if he wants to can act at wrongdoers and that was specifically allowed by section 5 so the defendant in a case if there is a wrongdoer other than the plaintiff and he wants to then defend him wants to bring the party in for the purpose of apportioning damages on the basis that he is a joint wrongdoer, the defendant could do so for section five. So that in a sense, it's, it's not exactly contributed negligence, it's about but it's, but it falls in the overall concept of sharing responsibility. So everyone is bought into one case and the liability is apportioned, and the court can reach a finding with regard to each party's respective liability. Um, so that's the principal effect of uh, Act Number 12 of 1968. The Act is based on the English Act of 1945. And that's one reason why it's not quite Roman Dutch law that applies when you look at uh, the subject of contributing negligence, because the, the provisions of the Act are almost identical to provisions in in the English Act of 1945. So in order to understand the scope of those provisions, you may need to get some guidance from the English precedents. But that doesn't change the uh, the fact that the common law, the, general, the, the basic common law for dealing is Roman Dutch law, and that has not changed that. So with regard to the uh, principles of, uh, the principles that come out of uh, the judicial precedence in the in respect of the uh, the law reform contributory negligence act number 1945 there aren't too many judicial precedents in sri lanka but the english precedents explain that uh, the the last opportunity rule which was there in england doesn't apply in view of that that's understood uh, the last both the last opportunity rule of the english rule and the roman dutch law rule uh, which was typically called the all or nothing rule, was all abrogated by that provision. And the, uh, the apportionment, the, the apportionment is a matter for the discretion of the judge. Now, there aren't, there, there aren't tailor-made straight jacket principles on how the apportionment should take place. But there are some precedents that are indicative of the type of apportionment that may take place. So, uh, so if it's a traffic accident, Typically, the type of uh, uh, contributing negligence that could be attributed to the plaintiff is the plaintiff, if he was a passenger or driver, was not wearing the seatbelt, his lights were not working, or his lights were not on, uh, the he headlights were not on, or the normal lights were not on, his tires were not in, uh, in proper condition, it, it skidded more and therefore caused more damage, or that the plaintiff was drunk um, and therefore was not able to uh, properly maneuver the vehicle. The plaintiff himself may have violated some road rules in, uh, in, in resulting in the accident being caused. So these are typical uh, things that the defendant can use against the plaintiff um, to argue that the plaintiff was also uh, was also contribute negligent for the damages that were caused. And the effect of those arguments, if the defendant is able to prove them against the plaintiff, is that the damages get reduced. So some examples of uh, the reduction in damages are uh, there are some precedents suggesting that if you don't wear a seat belt and if the lack of wearing a seat belt was the cause of the uh, accident, damages could reduce by as much as by 20% or 25%. Um, if it is, uh, there is one judicial precedent um, where if uh, where a driver had to drive uh, for a long uh, period of time and he fell asleep on the wheel. The employer uh, was held accountable for two thirds of the damages on the basis that he was responsible because he is the one who uh, expected the driver to drive for long hours. He should have the hours of the driver. Um, the, there was an incident where the damage was uh, incurred by uh, a ride on a motorcycle was reduced by a small sum by 10% because the helmet he was wearing was not fastened. So he was wearing a helmet, but it was not fastened. 
So for that act of contributing negligence, his damages were reduced by a small sum of 10%, but still it was reduced. So the percentages may vary. Ultimately, what the court is expected to look at is, uh, I mean, as Mr. Fernando explained, damages have to be proved. So you have to ultimately prove the quantum of damages that you're claiming. And uh, the court may have to look at the acts of contribute negligence, see what those acts of negligence, what damages were caused as a direct result of those neg acts of neg contribute negligence, and try and somehow make a reasonable assessment of the proportion that must be reduced on account of that contribute act of contribute negligence once proved. It's not an easy task. Um, it's not a definite science. It's all uh, it's primarily an estimate, but uh, the precedence gives some guidance as opposed to no guidance at all. But it's 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 a largely a matter for the discussion of court, and it has to be decided on a case by case basis. A lot of it would depend on the evidence that is led, uh, the type of damages that are caused, the quantum of damages, and the relative importance or the relative unimportance of the negligence that the defendant alleges against the plaintiff uh, with regard to the cause of damages vis-a-vis -vis in comparison to the total damages that were caused in that particular accident. So it's not an easy task. It's a difficult task for the, for the court to uh, arrive at in most cases. Um, and uh, but, the, but those are the principles that the court might be guided by. Now, before I leave uh, the topic of apportionment, um, there is one precedent um, that must be mentioned in the context of uh, contributing negligence. And um, that's the principle that, you know, in some times, um, accidents, accidents or acts of negligence may be caused by um, events that um, require sudden decisions. And you often don't have the luxury of time to sit in a you know in an ac room and think about the consequences that might follow um uh, because you have to take a sudden uh, call as to which what steps you are going to take so uh, the precedent that relates to that point it's referred to as jones versus boys it's an old precedent of 1816 and the, the principle there is that um if there uh, the uh, if due to uh, if the negligence of the defendant puts the plaintiff in a position of imminent personal danger, then conduct by the claimant, which in fact operates to cause harm to him, but which is nevertheless reasonable in the agony of the moment, does not amount to contributing negligence. So what it means, what in effect it says is, if the agony of the moment requires you to sort of take a decision which may nevertheless still cause you damage. Uh, and because of the agony of the moment, you couldn't elect between the better choice and the not so better choice. You still can't, you can't be held accountable on the basis of contributing negligence. So the example that the facts of that case was that uh, it's an old case in 1816, a time in, you know, there weren't cars, there were wagons and horses. And um, the, uh, the, the, the negligence was placing some piles on the road and the, the horse uh, became uh, ungovernable uh, while uh, going down the hill. And the plaintiff chose to jump off the horse and suffered injuries. Instead of electing to stay on the horse and go over the piles and suffer the consequences of what may happen if that happened. So he had a choice. He could stay on the horse or jump off. So if you take a modern example, it might be a case where... Uh, the defendant uh, has caused some accident on the road and uh, there, is a, there is a huge fire on the road and you are driving the car. So you have the option of either trying to brake and, um, uh, and risk colliding with that flaming vehicle or you risk jumping off the car, uh, hoping not to go into that risk, that collision. So, and you might suffer more damages if by jumping off the car. Uh, but possibly in a later trial with all the expert evidence, you might be able to, you know, more effectively prove that if you were not jumped on, off the car, but remained in the car, you might have suffered less damage. The question is, should it be contributed negligence? So the principle in Jones as a voice is that in that sort of case, 
uh, the concept of contributory negligence may not have a place. So it really requires uh, negligence in a case where you know you have had some time to think things over, and you have had and you had foreseeability that your actions can result in damages. So typically, a case where you get into the car, you don't wear a seat belt. And you know you you travel a distance and you have an accident. Of course, at the time when you got into the car, you didn't wear the seat, but you knew that if there was an accident, you will suffer more injury. So that sort of act is clearly contributing negligence. So another is you know going through a red light. Uh, you go to red light, you know there are other vehicles that might uh, come into collision with you because they will be going through a green light, and naturally that will be contributing negligence because you are trying to think it over before you went through the red light. So. Um, uh, you know, a modern day example is, uh, you know, after footlights, you might get into a vehicle with a colleague who is completely drunk <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, you might uh, meet an accident and uh, your colleague uh, might leave, might not leave, but, you know, you're the passenger and uh, you sue the uh, person who collided with the vehicle for damages because you have suffered injuries and, uh, and the person who, and that person can claim contribute negligence against you on the basis that you got into a vehicle uh, of, with the driver who was drunk and then you ran the risk of uh, of injury to yourself and and those are things we have time to think over uh, as opposed to um, things that catch you uh, with limited time and choice uh, due to spur the moment like what I said you know when you have uh, two or three options and you have like a second or ten seconds to think it over that type of act is arguably not uh, caught up in the concept of contributing negligence. But these are not precedents that have been decided in Sri Lanka, so it has to be possibly tested in Sri Lanka, but uh, there is some precedent suggesting that that line of authority. Right. Uh, wind up, uh, and, uh, a few minutes, if you can wind up. Yeah. Uh, moving on from contributing negligence to Act Number uh, 2 of 2019, it's a short act um, two pages, five sections. Um, it, the purpose of the act is to settle the law with regard to the consequences that follow if the injured party has died from, uh, from uh, due to the actions of the wrong word. Um, it, I, the act identifies the type of people who can be substituted. Um, the spouse, parents, children, siblings, grandparents and the guardian. Uh, they are identified as applicants. Um, so if the wrong, if, if the injured party dies due to uh, the, the wrongful act, these people can file action uh, as, um, as beneficiaries. Um, they, uh, they can also be substituted during the case. Um, so the uh, so arguments of succession, the right to survive, uh, will hopefully uh, go, go to rest because of the new act. Uh, it also settles the law that uh, if a person uh, dies, then these applicants, the spouse, parents, and siblings, and children, and so on, can ask for two additional categories of damages, which were possibly anyway allowed under common law. That is, loss of a person's love and affection and care and compensation, and mental pain and suffering. So that's in addition to whatever other damages that the uh, plaintiff would have been enti plaintiff is entitled to. Um, the, uh, the, however, if the applicant itself, uh, the applicant himself dies, there is no case of substitution. So in other words, if the person to whom the wrong was done died and then survived by the spouse, if the spouse dies, that's the end of that. There is no case of further substitution beyond that. There is provision for uh, an expert to be appointed. Um, unfortunately, the wording of the section is not entirely satisfactory. Um, it says that the expert is appointed, uh, the court may for the purpose of deciding any matter under this act, uh, call one or more persons specially skilled in any matter relevant uh, to the matter under consideration. Um, so the, the fact, the, 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 re the wording of the provision that calls upon it to uh, that limits it by reference to this act can possibly be used by uh, a party to say that the expert can uh, only be called for uh, the specific matters that are contemplated under this act and not for the entirety of the action. 
um, in which event the whole purpose of the expert is limited. If that argument is not upheld, then the then the ability to call an expert is uh, is welcome. The uh, expert is obviously called by court. Uh, it doesn't have to be listed by the party. Um, the fact that it means call means possibly the court may question the witness. I'm sure the the, the plaintiff and the defendant will be allowed to question the witness. Uh, but those provisions have not been dealt with expressly. It may come up in case law uh, down the line when this act comes up for interpretation. Um, that's it for me, Amit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Amit. Uh, years ago, medical procedures were something that was exclusively within the knowledge of medical professionals and non-medical persons found it difficult to understand what medicines were given to them or what kind of procedures were done on them. With the internet, things have changed now and people have become more knowledgeable. This knowledge has given rise to many cases being filed against doctors and hospitals for wrongful acts of omissions. Dr. Pereira, uh, will you be able to explain the salient matters uh, relating to claims on medical negligence? Uh, you are muted. Uh, all right. uh, Dr. Pereira, you are muted. You're mute. Avanti, you're muted. You're muted, Avanti. Right. Uh, Dr. Pereira. Uh, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Please go ahead. Thank you very much to the Bar Association for inviting me uh, as part of this eminent panel of uh, in, in this webinar series. Um, so I, I will deal specifically with one uh, area of negligence, that is medical negligence. When we mention medical negligence in Sri Lanka, the first and perhaps only case that comes to mind is, of course, the case of Priyani Soisa versus Rienzi Asukularatna. While that Supreme Court judgment was a watershed moment in medical negligence jurisprudence in Sri Lanka, and Justice Deeraratna analyzed all the important principles involved, not just in medical negligence, but an opinion action under common law in general, much has happened and changed since then. For example, the pre-trial process introduced in 2017. Then, as Mr. Amin mentioned, the enactment of the recovery of damages for the Death of a Person Act, number two of 2019. So what I propose to do is to place an incident of medical negligence within the framework of the larger law of negligence, and then trace the developments beyond and after the Priyani Soisa case. A lot of issues remain problematic areas in medical negligence litigation, whether you may be representing the plaintiff or the defendant. So I hope my brief presentation will open up a discussion on those areas. And myself, along with the two other panelists on this webinar, will be able to provide some clarity on those issues. The two speakers before me have already touched on the ingredients of a civil action based on a claim of negligence. I would like to begin by examining those ingredients in the context of medical negligence. So as Mr. Fernando spoke extensively about the duty of care, um, when we think of a, the, although we only think of the doctor very often, the surgeon as having a responsibility or a duty of care towards patients, there are several others in the healthcare service sector who may owe a duty of care and whose acts and omissions therefore would result in liability for medical negligence. For instance, the house officer or ward doctor who fails to monitor the progress of a patient 
the nurse who ignores the cries of a patient complaining of discomfort. The hospital itself for failing to provide proper medical equipment or skilled staff. Sometimes it may be a combination of errors which lead to a medical injury, but it is important to be able to identify the duty bearers and the nature of their individual duty towards the patient. This is all the more important because as Mr. Fernando says, said in a negligence, in, in a plane, the negligence has to be set out in detail. Who are the duty of care? How did the breach occur in, in that duty of care? Uh, and if you are the plaintiff and you need to ultimately prove causation, you will have to clearly demonstrate not only how the breach of a duty of care caused an injury, but who was responsible for that breach. In my experience, especially in civil cases where the attorney general undertakes uh, the brief to represent all or some of the defendants. Uh, vicarious liability is claimed against the state or a provincial authority who is the employer of the doctor or nurse. However, from a reading of the plaint, it is often apparent that there has been a systemic failure. A common and repeated injury uh, caused during cannulization, that is inserting a cannula into a patient, is piercing of an artery in the arm. Especially where child patients are involved because their limbs are small and it's very difficult to locate a vein. So sadly, many of these cases lead to setting of gangrene because there's blood clotting involved if you pierce an artery and the blood circulation is interrupted. And then finally, it might lead to having to amputate the arm of that child or person who is affected. Now, this was exactly what happened in a relatively new case that reached the Supreme Court in medical negligence. As you are aware, medical negligence litigation is actually rare compared to other negligence cases. And it was certainly very rare uh, in, in, at the time uh, the Kriani Soisa case, case was uh, argued. Now, of course, there's, there's more uh, litigation in this sphere. But in that SC appeal 152 of 2011, SC minutes of 11th October 2018, many, this was what happened because the nurse had pierced an artery after having engaged in about 30 minutes trying to locate a vein of this infant who was 21 days old. Now, many years before that, during my field research, I found that this was a recurrent problem. Uh, a lot of claims hadn't reached uh, courts, but I, I interviewed a lot of those who were aggrieved by, by following up on media reports, et cetera. And this was predominant in, in my, uh, uh, the, the research participant cohort, uh, that a lot of children had had their limbs, uh, the limbs had had to be amputated because of damage caused to the artery during cannulization. So in this, in this case, in, in uh, in the SC appeal 152 of 2011, as I said, it was a 21 year old infant at the special baby care unit of the Ketumati Hospital in Panadura. Now, nurses were actually specially trained. There was evidence led to say that there was training offered to these nurses. And, and the defendant in that, the first appellant, was a senior nurse with 26 years of experience. And yet, this misadventure eventually. Uh, the court decided to be medical negligence occurred, unfortunately, in that case. Still, the court held her to be liable and held that the Western Province Council, uh, Western Provincial Council, which was the employee, uh, employer of the nurse, vicariously liable. Now, I think this was actually a systemic failure and the hospital also could have been held liable in fact, the director of the hospital had also been named but had been discharged uh, at a previous stage of the, uh, of the case. But here was a case where perhaps even though the training was offered, perhaps the training was not adequate. And because this is a recurrent problem, I think it was an ideal opportunity, especially be because Justice Priyanta Jayawardena uh, held the hospital uh, to be liable, even though the hospital was not a party, that he actually makes an observation that the hospital owed a duty of care and had failed 
in, uh, in, in maintaining that duty of care, providing that duty of care. So I think this was a case where actually corporate liability, primary duty on the part of the hospital could have been explored and, and uh, the jurisprudence could have been developed in that regard. To my understanding, maybe that I, I find that corporate liability is rare in medical negligence cases. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the, those of you, Mr. Fernando, et cetera, who have more experience, uh, where, where those cases probably don't reach the Attorney General's department. I, I'm sure you have appeared for hospitals where corporate duty may have been, or corporate uh, liability may have been claimed. But I find that that is relatively rare. rare. But it is a very useful tool for several reasons. One is that as we know, doctors are very reluctant to testify against professional colleagues. But I think that if the defendant is a hospital and therefore an institution, you can't put a face to it, expert evidence may be more forthcoming uh, to the advantage of a plaintiff. So that, that is something that should be explored if in fact it is applicable. And as, as Mr. Fernando discussed, foreseeability plays a role in this. Corporate uh, liability and a corporate duty of care would arise in uh, two ways primarily. One is that a hospital owes a duty to provide competent, skilled staff. The other is that it should provide equipment and also policies uh, which, uh, which would minimize uh, negligence, which, which, which are of a particular standard of care. So if those uh, standards fall, if their staff fall below the standards, the hospital also owes a primary non-delegable duty of care, which is not vicarious. Then also it is useful because in medical negligence cases, the tendency of institutions is to go up into cover-up mode. They want to protect themselves. They are not going to divulge to that aggrieved party who the doctor was, who the nurse was, or any of the facts which may help a claimant. So if you make the hospital a party, then again, these identif identification problems may be minimized. So I think this is an avenue that should be explored by those who haven't yet explored it. So the next ingredient in a medical negligence case is the breach of the duty of care. This really is the crux of a medical negligence case and where the most technical evidence will have to be led. In order to prove or disprove a breach, one must first establish what the standard of care should have been. How would a reasonable medical professional have acted in the given situation? Remember that a doctor is not guilty of negligence if he has acted in accordance with the practice which is accepted by a responsible body of medical persons even if there may be another body of opinion which takes a contrary view. As you know, there can be different views even in, in, even in scientific spheres. But if at least one expert can come forth and it, is, it, is, it can be, the court will recognize that this is somebody worth listening to and, and somebody who sh they should take seriously, that is sufficient if the doctor can say, no, they are, this body of this school of thought uh, of medical personnel uh, I, I acted in accordance with that school of thought. So I have not fallen below the standard of care. So, it, but remember that after the uh, Bolam case, now the Bolam case is where that test was really laid down. What I just read out is the fact that if you, uh, if it's a reason, a doctor who has acted uh, in accordance with the practice, which is accepted by the profession. So that was the Bolam test. And for those lawyers representing, I said, it's enough if you can find an expert who will, uh, testify to that standard uh, observed by the defendant doctor. But you must remember that after the Bolitho case, which came uh, 30 years or more after the Bolam test, in the Bolitho case, now judges, it was recognized that judges can exercise discretion to reject even an expert medical opinion if it is not capable of withstanding logic. So often we think that in these types of very specialist uh, litigation, the judges might play a passive role and leave it to professionals to argue it out because, I mean, as lawyers, as, as those with only a legal education, what do we know about medicine after all, right? But here in this Bolito case, it expressly recognized 
that a judge, judge is expected to engage in a more critical assessment of medical evidence rather than unquestioning the ex accepting expert testimony. Whether they do it or not in Sri Lanka is, of course, another matter. However, both the medical and legal systems have developed in Sri Lanka since the Priyani Soisa case. And these developments are useful for medical negligence litigation, but particularly where the standard of care, because in the Piani Soisa case, it was the Bolam principle, the Bolitho test, which were, uh, which were applied. But now we have to, as Mr. Riyad Amin also, uh, also stressed on, there are statutory encroachments into the common law of negligence. And these might be important tools to actually minimize some of the problems and disputes of a medical negligence case. Uh, I begin with the pre-trial steps introduced by the Civil Procedure Code Amendment Act number eight of 2017, which, can, which, which really is, is an effective tool, I think, which can be used to iron out some fundamental issues. Section 142D, for instance, it says that at the pre-trial hearing, the judge conducting the pre-trial uh, shall have power to question the parties or call upon them to state their respective cases with a view to these aspects which are particularly relevant to medical negligence cases, elucidating the matters in dispute, that is 142 D, uh, subsection B, then obtaining admissions of facts and of documents. Uh, then F, which I think is very important, that is appointing a court expert. Now, this is very important because, as I said, in, we are we have a, an adversarial system in Sri Lanka. And to be able to have an independent expert who the court can rely on without it being a, a, win, a, a situation where it's a, a, a battle between the parties rather than an inquisitorial process, a court-appointed expert can, I think, be a very useful tool to minimize some of the disputes. And then, of course, there's also provision to assist the parties to arrive at an adjustment, settlement, compromise, or other agreement. This is also important because in most medical negligence cases, although compensation is really what can be claimed in a civil lawsuit, often the plaintiffs are really not interested in that, unless, of course, there has been some incident where the patient is now in a vegetative state and requires expensive medical treatment for life, palliative care, or, or there are dependents who have lost their breadwinner. But often I found, and again, this was in my research over 10 years ago, of course, I don't think it has changed though. They are looking, the plaintiffs, the aggrieved parties are looking for an explanation, an apology, an inquiry, not so much the money, and they just want to prevent recurrence. So with with all that in mind, the larger picture in mind, perhaps this pre-trial stage can be used to even uh, allow the case to be resolved at an earlier stage without parties having to engage in a long drawn out costly legal battle. And then section 142D has to be read with the powers of the judge under section 142E of the Civil Procedure Court. And that is that A, it says the, the judge can make an order regarding any question of fact determined by a written report from a person having special and independent knowledge of that fact. So here is the moment where that expert testimony now can be recorded and can be accepted at a very early stage of the trial. So this could also be possibly read with Section 5 of the Recovery of uh, Damages Act number 2 of 2019. Uh, Mr. Amin was correct that section is not very clear, and it may only be on the question of damages that an expert is called, but if, if, it, if it is interpreted to be broader and, and an expert giving medical evidence is also caught up in that. These can these provisions of the Civil Procedure Code and that act can be read together and used. And also at section 142E subsection B, there is a provision for the issue of a commission uh, under chapter 29 of the code, inclusive, an, inclusive of an order for the appointment of an independent expert. So again, coming back to this question of medical expert medical testimony, which, which really is what decides the medical negligence case. Um, 
Then also, importantly, subsection C, that is an order to issue certified copies of any documents in the custody of any public office, public corporation, provincial council, or local authority. Here is a moment where you can possibly call for the BHT, which again has all the important information hopefully documented, recorded, which will allow parties to get a better picture and see where they stand in the case. Now, I, I will come to the importance of BHDs later, but, uh, but another thing that is lacking in a lot of medical negligence cases is BHDs which are properly maintained. And in fact, in the Priyani Soita case as well, uh, Justice Ziradatna observed that the doctor was remiss in maintaining the BHD. Now, this is an ideal stage, therefore, this pre-trial stage for both parties to minimize the matters in dispute and also may even end in a settlement. Um, another development since the Priyani Soisa case is the availability of clinical guidelines. Uh, even then, perhaps there was, but now it, it, it is available in more, more spheres of the, the med medical profession. Uh, which can be used to minimize the trial into medical technicalities. Now, even in that SC Appeal 152 of 2011, they looked at the protocols which should be observed with regard to cannulization and how much time, the, the monitoring process, how long it should take, et cetera, et cetera. So there were clinical guidelines set down by the our national guidelines here. It could be also set out by professional colleges, the different colleges of surgeons, of the college of general physicians, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, what the standard is. So then again, you don't have to rely on experts because here it is, it is all documented and the, the adversarial nature is minimized. Another important thing, I mean, this is my, my take on it, I'm probably not used, but may, may be used, uh, is the RTI Act, uh, where, as you know, Section 5E excludes access to medical records because those are confidential matters, right? Where, where, but I think, uh, it can be used for a plaintiff who says that there is systemic error and probably suing on the basis of corporate liability to call for monthly reviews or the reporting mechanisms like there are in hospitals, the mortality rates, there are doctors, uh, the hospitals are required to have these reporting sessions where they assess uh, what the past and how you can improve uh, going forward. So maybe that material is relevant to see whether this hospital has a systemic problem. What is the degree of uh, in the injury rates, the adverse uh, incidents, etc. So this might be used to call for that for a patient, a claimant to get an assessment of the kind of standard of care or the lack thereof, which is in that particular hospital where a patient has suffered a medical injury. Then again, one should be able to rely on uh, uh, the report of a forensic pathologist because that also is sometimes rare. They don't often, the JMO might not record that it's uh, due to a medical error, but sometimes that is recorded. And that's also important that that will strengthen the plaintiff's case. Then of course, as I said, I, I, BHDs are very important. That is where most of the answers lie because it will show if properly maintained whether a patient was monitored the correct medicines prescribed were actually given, provided, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then the third ingredient, that is causation. This is where actually the claimant in the Priyani Soisa case failed because in that case, the child died and it was inevitable because it was a, it was a brain tumor. So even though the Supreme Court found that the, the doctor, Professor Priyani Soisa, had been negligent to some extent, there was no nexus between her negligence and the death of the child. But causation is very important because that's something the defense can use because the plaintiff has to be able to show that it is exactly that particular act or omission of the defendant which caused the injury and has to be able to exclude any other possibilities. Now, in that case of the, the Supreme Court, I keep going back to that because it's a, it, it's a relatively new case uh, and perhaps the only other one to reach the Supreme Court after Priyani Soisa's case. Uh, there, the nurse said this injury to the artery could have occurred when somebody was taking a blood test or then the child was having fits while the cannula was already in place and then the cannula got dislocated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the judges found that none of those possibilities were the cause. So they excluded those possibilities and placed the liability 
very fairly and squarely on the nerves at the point at which she inserted the cannula. And causation is also important because often the cause for the injury is not really the surgery or the main medical intervention, but it is aftercare. It's the lack of monitoring a patient, what I call secondary negligence, which is often the result of, uh, which often leads to a medical injury. Then the last aspect, damages. Yes, so uh, during, uh, at, at the stage of Piani Soisa's case, sentimental loss was not recognized in our law because the uh, Roman Dutch law doesn't uh, only recognizes patrimonial, that is financial loss. Uh, but by this statutory, statutory encroachment to the recovery of damages of a person at uh, number two of 2019, sentimental loss, that is loss for the love, uh, love loss of love and care uh, of a person, a loved one, that is lost, then one can claim. Again, the apportionment is something which has to be tested because we don't have guidelines on that. Um, so these are some important features because even sentimental loss, Justice Zero Rath naturally makes a comment that he's, it's almost as though he laments that his hands are tied, that he can't uh, uh, really provide this. And he suggests, I believe, that there must be some statutory, uh, statutory um, uh, encroachment to uh, allow plaintiffs to claim this. So, and that happened many, many years later with this act. Um, so, just looking forward, yes, let me just touch briefly on a few defenses. Uh, Mr. Fernando touched on general defenses. So, for a doctor, also, those same defenses apply contributory negligence, for instance, uh, once a patient has already being treated and he's prescribed uh, medicine or how to, uh, how to take care of himself thereafter and then fails to do so, then contributory negligence. That, that, can, that, can, be a, that can be a defense if the, uh, the injury is suffered as a, loss of, as, as a result of the patient not following doctor's orders. Then informed consent, which is very, very important, uh, is, is, is a, can be a defense and also ca can be to the advantage of the patient if he's able to show that in fact consent wasn't obtained. Obviously this doesn't apply in emergency situations, but, uh, but where risk disclosure is very, very important for a patient, it is something that the patient can say, no, I was not told that this could happen. I, I didn't give my consent with all the necessary information that I ought to have had. Now in, in Sri Lanka, I don't know, perhaps in cosmetic surgery and, and in private hospitals, things might be far more advanced, but as we all know, in a government hospital, it's a sh sheet of paper. Perhaps there is no sheet of paper or the person doesn't understand the language it is in because of, let's say, Sinhala, lang Sinhala and Tamil uh, language linguistic limitations in particular provinces. And then you sign this blindly without knowing what you're in for. So the practicalities of that, but it is still, it could be used as a defense if that piece of paper is there and the doctor can say, no, the patient gave me informed consent. So he took the risks voluntary non in injuria. Then medical negligence has to be distinguished from error of judgment. Medical negligence, like any other type of negligence, is all about foreseeability. If something is a complication, which could have happened one in a million with the percentage, or it was just uh, uh, something that the doctor could not have foreseen again, that's a, that's a defense. Then, of course, there are resource limitations and, of course, emergency situations. These are not defenses which are recognized by law, but it will help to, for the court to assess what the standard of care was in that particular situation, what a reasonable doctor ought to have uh, applied. So I want to conclude by just saying how we can look, look to the future as practitioners. And if there are doctors listening in uh, and joining on, on the on live stream, uh, it's important in this COVID-19 pandemic era that there could be vaccine-related deaths and medical negligence claims with regard to, let's say, again, going back to informed consent, if a patient says he, he wasn't asked whether he had these allergies, which have then reactions to the, va the vaccine will have reactions, then these are perhaps, uh, perhaps grounds for more medical negligence cases to be built up. And then, of course, that's very interesting. One particular medical negligence case has actually reached the Supreme Court through a fundamental rights application. It's pending, so I can't talk much about it, but 
I can only say that leave to proceed was granted. That is SC uh, minutes of September 28, 2020. The case number is SC uh, Reg CHA miscellaneous one of 2014. So maybe that's something we can follow because medical negligence, which is very much in the private law sphere, has now obviously transcended and gone into the public law uh, sphere. So it's a development that we can look forward to because the claims are also that perhaps this doctor was guilty of criminal negligence and there's a failure on the part of the, the inaction by the state authorities to take action, the police or even the attorney general. So those are use those are new uh, developments and interesting developments in our jurisprudence so i i just end as i always do when i speak about medical negligence understand the issues involved was the error due to misadventure or negligence was it the attitude of the doctor that prompted the grievance in the priyani soisa case i'm sad to say it was the partly the arrogance of that defendant doctor which prompted the defend uh, the, the the plaintiff to make that claim then this, this is often a complaint by most patients that doctors are dismissive and they otherwise they're still, the patients still have this sort of ape dostara. They look up to the doctor and have this tremendous amount of trust. But when they're treated dismissively, anger builds up and then unfortunately leads to a medical negligence claim, which should never be. Then, of course, as I said, try to prevent secondary negligence because failure to monitor often is the, is the cause of most injuries. And should there be better dispute resolution systems, reporting of errors, inquiries, so that these don't go into adversarial, uh, go into the adversarial sphere. And I end by saying a, a duty of care with regard to the duty of candor, that is honesty, when something goes wrong, which is not, I think, tested in our law, but it was there as far back, it was recognized. A glimpse of it you can find in AG versus Smith, 8 NLR 229. Over, century, over a century back, where the courts recognized that, court, that, that the hospital system ought not to have suppressed information and had ordered duty of care to disclose, even when something goes wrong. So that may be a new duty of care aspect uh, tied up into a negligence claim, which can be explored. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pereira. Uh, we have gone beyond the time allocated, but uh, there are two questions, uh, two or three questions. Uh, first question I can put to Mr. Nihal Fernando, President's Council, sir. Uh, uh, adding an insurance company to a case, and uh, we have come across prayers for joint and several liability. There seems to be still some misconce misconception on this matter and the liability of the insurance company. If you can please explain how the insurance company is brought in and how the insurance company is made liable in terms of the law. Uh, if you can explain that point, sir. Yes, yes. Now, <clears throat> that's actually most of the outstation lawyers, they think that they sue the insurance company and they have to get money from the insurance company. That is not so. Any accident case, the insurance company is made a party uh, or in the earlier law, they were defended by the insurance company based on a section in the Motor Traffic Act. And the Motor Traffic Act says that in the event of, you can't put out a vehicle to the road without a third party insurance. So in those circumstances, a decree entered, a decree entered against the defendant, driver or the owner, can be recovered from the insurance company. So the insurance company comes in only at the stage of recovery of damages to satisfy the decree. And this went on for some time and there was a lot of collusion and fraud. In fact, in one of my cases, they claimed 5 million. The insurance company couldn't get the proxy signed and they went and asked the plaintiff for the, uh, the defenders for the proxy. They said, why should I pay, give you the proxies? The plaintiff has agreed to give me 1 million not to contest the defense, not to contest this case. So they get 5 million, they give 1 million to the defenders and the whole thing. Then the insurance industry lobbied and got the, in, uh, the Motor Traffic Act amended to make it compulsory to a plaintiff to make the insurance company a party because at the stage of the uh, police statements, they have to record the insurance company's name. So they are aware and they cannot sue without notifying the insurance company of a claim, giving prior notice. In addition to that, 
they made it compulsory that the insurance company should be made a party so that at least they can contest the liability aspect of it. Now, this is all because in Sri Lanka, there is no no-fault liability is not part of the Sri Lankan law. I've been agitating, asking the law commission to put that in like in England. But in Sri Lanka, there is liability arises in respect of negligence for so the insurance companies only if it is legally, they are legally liable. So insurance companies don't pay unless they are basically pushed to a corner. So they have they, they get the plaintiffs to file action and they prove negligence. So people think that a lot of the defend plaintiffs think that you know they get they have to be paid by the insurance company. That is not so. It is the insurance company that only satisfies the decree after decree is entered. So because of that, they step into the shoes of the defendants and defend the case, and particularly the quantum. When they know that the insurance is involved, which is the damage is ten thousand, they'll make claim one million or whatever. So that has been the practice. So now this is rectified by this process of amendment to the insurer, the motor traffic act, where it is said that the insurance company being made a party is compulsory. And decree can be enforced against the insurance company in those circumstances. The, the recent case which I now got involved was that uh, where Gamina, just the judgment where they say that you can't get a declaration of non-liability even if the the, the person was under intoxication or under the influence of liquor and all that. I mean, that is not relevant to the negligence part of it. It is only the applicability of this aspect of it. I mean, having said that, before you go to the next question, can I just uh, go on with some other areas which need to be addressed? That is, uh, Dr. Avanti, I think we discussed, you discussed very well about the defenses. One of the main defenses, particularly in the case of medical negligence, is necessity, which I forgot, which I, which I missed out when I was dealing with the defenses. Necessity, that is, for example, if a person, a patient is dying and you have to do a particular operation, and if that operation is successful, the patient's quality of life will be much better than without doing, not doing that, or prescribing a drug. So you, the doctors assess how it will affect and how it affects the how the side effects will affect the will you with the will the side effects be or what is the percentage of this patient getting the side effects and what will be the quality of life if you take this medication with the side effect? so those are the defense of necessity is something that is very important to be taken by the doctors and that that's very important the second item that i made a note of it when you were making the Dr. Ramanthi was making her presentation because she has a lot of experience in doing these cases as you mentioned about the public hospitals in Sri Lanka. Uh, I believe there is some law which says that public servants are made liable, they have to be made liable in person, personally. There is a, there's a book on negligence of public servants which uh, I've done some research for a pending matter at the moment. Uh, so yeah, we find that you can't make the government a party, but uh, you make the uh, attorney general a party probably, but the, the public servants are made liable in their personal capacity. There is, uh, I have that book with me uh, by Dr. Amar Singh, uh, public servants liability. So that is one other aspect. Other aspect is with regard to, again, uh, the parties, the civil procedure court provides that if the plaintiff is in doubt as to the party who is negligent, and very often, as you mentioned, as your the presentation, super presentation, Dr. Uba, you mentioned, sometimes the hospital hide things, sometimes the doctors gang up together and don't give evidence. Not only in the case of uh, this kind of operation, even engineers in the construction industry, they do the same thing. So in those circumstances, if the plaintiff is finding it difficult to pin down a person to be directly negligent, or the vicariously liable person, you can make all parties defendants and ask the court to decide after evidence who is responsible. There is provision in the civil procedure code for that. Then in addition to the uh, new development in the civil procedure code amendment about pre-trial, uh, there has been an age-old section in the civil procedure code asking for discovery and interrogatories. That has to be used. Very few people use that. And I invite most of the plaintiffs, the people, lawyers that drop plaintiffs to use that. 
and ask for interrogatories, question the witness, uh, question the defendants or the plaintiffs. It, pro it takes a lot of time off. That is to say that the time that it will take to call witnesses and evidence, because you're obliged to answer those questions by way of an affidavit. And they are, you're stuck with that, you know, once you answer. Of course, there, is, there, there are a lot of fishing expeditions. You can't, you can't go on a fishing expedition to prove your case by interrogatories. Those are matters that defenses that they can take up. So that is another matter. Other one that I wish to state is that uh, even with regard to the construction industry, the construction industry where we have done a lot of work, where they construct something which damages the neighboring house and how it could be proved. That I'm saying this because of the sections that you referred to in the in the civil procedure code, the amendment pre-trial proceedings, you can ask for experts, and we do. We quite often do because lawyers are not experts in engineering, and neither the judges. So what they do is it's much easier for them to file a motion and say issue a commission and give a report by an independent engineer or a the engineer and an expert, quantity surveyor or whatever. So that takes care of major part of your proving your damages when it comes to this kind of uh, cases with regard to how we get involved is in the uh, all construction industry. There is an uh, insurance policy called the all-party risk insurance. All uh, It's called a uh, all-party risk insurance policy where the contractors are obliged to take when they commence construction. That is booming now because of the uh, lot of apartment complexes and high-rise buildings that are coming up. So in those circumstances, when they are sued, the lawyers represent the insurance company and the defend through them the defendants. So there are again sometimes the house that is damaged is damaged due to faulty construction or faulty design by themselves. Again, contributory negligence comes in there, right? And the point that I'm trying to make is that there again this procedure of asking an expert report is available and should be used by the parties to minimize the time period in proceeding with the case and concluding the case. Finally, you dealt with causation. Another matter that I forgot to inform you is that case law encroachment into the negligence common law aspect of it. Um, Mr. Amin, we will know that real, Mr. Amin, you will know that uh, a ship is arrested negligently. There is the Kalani's case which I mentioned. You can claim damages for wrongfully gross negligence for arresting a ship by a party you can put a counterclaim by the ship owners. Then, proving of damages, there is this Lord Gunnar's judgment where he dealt with uh, Lord Denning. It is a fine, fine quotation which says that you can't, if you are claiming, the, the plaintiff is claiming damages, you can't throw a figure at court and expect the court to give you damages. You have to prove it. You have to prove it. So that is a statement that is used by me quite often in claiming, in, in defending damages claims. The plaintiff is obliged to prove the damages in any case. So those are the areas that I thought I will deal with arising out of the uh, superb presentations done by Riyadamin, my friend Riyadamin and Dr. Avanti. Thank you, Amit. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Amit, are you Thank there? You yeah. the Thank, you. Thank you for the final input. Thank you for the final input, sir. Those were very, very uh, helpful for the, uh, the practitioners. With that, I now hand over the, the, the webinar back to uh, the back to Jamika. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Silva. With that, I would like to thank our panelists this evening. Ms. Nihal Fernando, President's Council, Mr. Ria Jami, Dr. Avanti Pereira, and the moderator of the session, Mr. Amit Silva, for a very informative and valuable session. I would also like to thank all of, all of you who join us through Zoom and YouTube and for your patience that have made this webinar an interesting one. Thank you, everyone. Join us again on next Saturday at 5.30 p.m. on another webinar in this series on a different topic. Until then, stay safe.